Hello, I'm David Hirely, and I'm delighted to invite you into this course on visual tools for complex learning and thinking. And this first introductory hour, and then three sessions to come after that. So putting together this course has been a delight because it has given me the opportunity to bring a lot of things together that I've been thinking about over the last few years. And particularly in this, this last more difficult year, where we are confronted with a pandemic that is really engaging us and our learners, our students, in more of the virtual world and at a time when the visual world is also uh, so essential to us as we're accessing information from all different places, uh, different websites, uh, and visually presenting ourselves such as this uh, as we use Zoom and, and Skype and uh, Google Meet, where we're in little boxes and visually presenting ideas uh, from afar. So I think this course is going to be interesting just by way of its timeliness, but also because we're also in a transition, I believe, in education toward, toward a, new para, uh, a new paradigm that goes beyond um, what we've done before in education, which is a primary focus on content learning specifically, and really only implicitly developing the thinking abilities of all students from early years up through learners in the workplace. So let me share my screen right now, and I'm going to jump into um, this presentation that I've put together, and uh, it really um, brings to me uh, this point of saying that the visual tools are not just for complex learning and thinking in the sense of what happens in classrooms, but also at a time of abundant information. Uh, some of it misinformation, some of it disinformation, and some of it just darkly involved in uh, manipulating uh, people of uh, all ages around the world. So. Let me just give you a little bit of background of, of how I brought myself to this point, being with you. And uh, one of the points was uh, the, the writing of this book, which um, in its second edition was really generated uh, in essence a long time ago, which was visual tools for transforming information into knowledge. And I'm gonna be sharing a lot of this book uh, on the next, uh, in the next seminars that we have together. But it really, for me, started uh, long before that. Actually, let me just give you a little bit of history. Um, this, is, this is actually my father. He was uh, born in 1929 in Berkeley, California, in the United States. And uh, he was invited <laughs> through uh, my grandparents into the longest of longitudinal studies ever done on human development. So every few weeks of his early life and then every month and then finally every year up until uh, age 18, uh, my father was brought into uh, the Institute, a building in Berkeley, California, where doctors and psychologists and, and linguists and those interested in physical and social and emotional development would basically uh, test him all day long. So he was given IQ tests that were then in 1929, just becoming very popular, uh, along with uh, developmental issues of, of strength and, and even his weight and the way he moved and uh, his social emotional development. So here are some of the notes actually um, from that one of those first visits um, this is maybe uh, four or five months after he was born. Uh, notice the, the analysis. He picks up blocks. They, they were observing him, right? Pushes himself up strongly, begins to play with paper, smiling at himself in the mirror, and reaching out persistently for toys uh, just out of reach. And he picks up blocks deftly and directly. So what my father went through it was the same thing that I went through when I was born in 1955. So every year of my life up through uh, 18 years old, I was brought in by my parents into the Institute that by the way, still exists today in Berkeley uh, at UC Berkeley. And I was 
put through the same battery of tests, IQ tests, uh, strength tests, how I was, my body was growing, social, emotional. As uh, the years went on, they would interview me about my relationship with my, my siblings, with friends, with my parents. So this was a holistic view of the development of humankind. And I trace back my interest in cognitive development and teaching and education and really the focus on thinking, um, I trace it back to this time when I was asked all these questions and, and by the way, never given answers. I was not uh, being tested as we would evaluate it in a classroom or in standardized tests. I was being poked and prodded with questions, with problem solving, um, uh, examples with social emotional questions to the point where I became more reflective. I became uh, thinking with each day how I was thinking about things, how I was interacting with other people. Um, by the way, though, at this time, IQ testing was foundational to how uh, cognitive scientists uh, were thinking about the development of human abilities. And these IQ tests, of course, uh, have been used in, in ways that are not so uh, beneficial to humankind and to certain groups of people. As a matter of fact, they've, they've put uh, the IQ testing um, movement uh, really put people in boxes. And we've grown through Howard Gardner's work on multiple intelligences in the 80s to a point where we recognize a range of different ways of uh, thinking about the world, engaging with the world. And that's really where we are right now, this view that uh, human development and the development of student thinking is key to what we do in classrooms, even though what we test and what we teach often is content specific information for memorization oftentimes for rote learning. So I actually entered the, uh, the field of teaching uh, in Oakland, California, and I taught with, um, within a, a string of schools, primary, uh, middle, and secondary schools, high schools here in the U.S., in uh, West Oakland with uh, primarily African-American youth. And um, it was really an eye-opener for me because at that time, 1980s, this is when Howard Gardner came out with his multiple intelligences idea. And really the field of thinking became, if you would, popular. I was teaching uh, using the THINK program, as it was called. And I was um, focusing on not just content learning with students, but engaging explicitly in the development of their thinking ability uh, cognitive processes, uh, particularly. And it was an eye opener. A lot of these students, these were my students, actually, my last day of teaching in a regular classroom. And all of these students were brilliant, interesting, multi-dimensional kids, but they were all mostly scoring in the lower quartiles in standardized tests. So at that point, it really launched me into an interest in how do we really facilitate thinking? How do we develop, as uh, Dr. Yvette Jackson calls it, high intellectual performance? How do we engage disposition, such as Art Costa's habits of mind? How do we engage creativity and still stay focused on the content learning that is ever more important? So that's a little bit of my, my background. Um, actually, coming out of this experience with the THINK program drove me to consider the use of visual tools, because in that THINK program, there were reading selections and traditional reading comprehension questions that, that students uh, were asked to answer and that I facilitated. And at the same time, there were some diagrams such as flow charting and tree diagrams and a range of different kinds of visual representations of the information. So these students, I saw them grow intellectually right before my eyes when we moved beyond the, the, the traditional reading comprehension activity to focus on having them visually uh, represent their ideas. So that's a little bit of my background. I wanted to give that to you because it really propels me on a, to this day to focus on issues of equity and how all students 
are uh, provided with the opportunities um, that many of us have to have higher order thinking and high intellectual engagement at the center of, of teaching and learning. So what I want to really point out, and, and here's a, a football pitch uh, that we talk a lot about in, in, talk a lot in education about the idea of leveling the playing field. And actually, I believe until we really focus explicitly on thinking development, uh, if we really focus on the cognitive development of every child and the social emotional learning that frames that cognition, uh, we're not going to be able to level the field because it'll just become more ever more complex content knowledge without the facilitation of thinking. So I think we need to change the playing field, not just balance it, because a lot of the standardized tests today, a lot of the uh, tests that were, have been given in the past, a lot of the evaluations and assessments and standardization of content teaching and learning has been around the bell curve. That there are uh, those in the middle that perform what you'd consider normally, those that are perceived as you know gifted, as we used to call a lot of students, and those that are underperforming uh, and underperforming in the sense of this bell curve. So what we're really interested now in, I believe, in education, what the focus, what this new paradigm is about, is engaging all students uh, with a focus on the development of their thinking very explicitly. And so what we have to do is modify the pitch. What we have to do is see that it's adaptive and see that we can really engage all students uh, from early ages, early years, and, and early childhood before they even get into school, all the way through uh, the workplace and university work and um, engage in collaborative thinking together so that what rises up is an explicitness of how we're thinking about the content, not just a testing of the content itself. So, with that, let's just jump into um, some of the, uh, the range of uh, topics that we're going to deal with in this seminar. Uh, today, what we're going to do is really focus on uh, a reframing of visual tools. We're going to jump into some different types of visual tools, as you'll see, uh, visual tools that you've used before, such as brainstorming webs and different kinds of graphic organizers and concept mapping, and then introduce in, in uh, briefly the thinking maps. And then we'll go into the next session, the second part of our uh, webinar series, really focused on uh, process or process maps in depth. And this means concept mapping and systems thinking. And this really gets to moving students from a novice level, and I'm talking four or five year olds, um, up through an expert level at any age, at any time in their educational uh, experiences. So we'll look at thinking process maps. And then the third session will really be a deep dive into the thinking maps model, which I see as an integration of different types of visual tools and a real language that's used and has been used successfully across schools for now, for now decades. And the fourth one, the fourth session I'm really looking forward to because it's gonna stretch me a little bit more to think about how we use visual tools for assessment, not just um, content, assessing the content knowledge of students, but also really involving them in formative assessment of their own thinking over time. Uh, there'll be a last piece in there. What does it look like? What's the next generation of visual tools? And just to, to give you a, a sneak peek at that, I want to say that I just bought some uh, virtual reality goggles. I've never been in the virtual augmented reality uh, field before. And we're going to look at even uh, possibility of 3D visual tools. So a lot to look forward to. But let's just jump right in and, and recognize that um, I know that this quote has been used a lot over the years. But the idea that the significant problems we face today cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created those same problems. And we have generational problems um, that are still with us, uh, developmental problems around the world. 
And I really believe that uh, education is at a turning point, that we're really looking at a time where students voice is key, that their engagement with the world at a very early age is becoming ever more important because they're exposed to information from so many different sources. The problems are being put before them. The information is being put before them as they explore on the web uh, the ideas that we're faced with. And of course, one of the biggest ones is climate. And we're gonna um, use, uh, really look into a lot of different content areas, but uh, we're gonna use some examples, everything from apples and algebra to climate change um, and what is how to really use visual tools in the classroom for the 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 common uh, content that we're trying to teach uh, and the pro processes of literacy reading and writing compre and reading comprehension and writing um, but also the engagement with uh, areas of science and uh, issues that are before uh, all of our uh, all of our long, young learners around the world, which is which is climate change. Uh, notice right here. This is this is a page out of a um, out of a magazine, Time magazine, uh, just this last month, and you could even see that now, unlike years ago, the use of graphics uh, are are everywhere, and embedded in those graphics is a lot of information, different kinds of representations. And uh, that's what we have. That's what students are really engaged with, is not just um, Instagram videos or uh, TikTok, and, you know, 10, 12 second clips, but also graphics that are deeply complex that uh, hold a lot of information. So we're also gonna look at how different kinds of visual tools help students to process um, different kinds of information, but also to represent their thinking and to work through and problem solve. So that's what we're really looking at is thinking through this time of overwhelming information, misinformation, disinformation. And um, as one, um, one British uh, writer wrote about uh, recently, the idea that there are dark patterns uh, in the web. And these dark, dark patterns are basically what happens when students and all of us get into a website and, and order something or um, are, have to uh, maybe try to cancel a subscription, anything, it doesn't really matter. What's going on is there are different algorithms that are at work that influence how and what we do on the web. So um, maybe I'm taking on too much here with this course in, in thinking about how we use visual tools, but it's mostly about how we develop student thinking on a day-to-day -day basis. So they're confronted with a lot of information coming through a lot of different sources. Uh, and it's very much just like uh, the food and water. Information is coming uh, to students in so many different ways. And as teachers, we're trying to you know, maneuver through this field of information where once uh, we were able to give students a textbook and that was this one of the sole sources and our libraries for information. But now, um, just like food and water, information is everywhere. It's available to most of us on a daily basis. So how is it that uh, students are able to process this information and really be able to step back and think about how they're thinking about this information. It's even in the food we eat. I love this. Uh, some years ago, I, I was uh, in, in a store here um, buying some chicken for dinner. And here I came across uh, even smart chicken. So the idea that there are smart phones, there are smart chickens. Um, but remember, even this smart chicken who here has, the, um, has graduated uh, it's about information. What's in the products we eat, what is in the, the content of the textbooks that we offer students now online, what is the content and, and how do they process that information. So that's where we're going. This whole idea of visual tools, I, I really want to broaden and reframe in the sense that 
it isn't just about um, another tool or another strategy um, which we can use in a limited way. It's really offering students a language and a, a way of thinking about information to be able to really deal with the network of ideas that are before them. Uh, the range of different kinds of thinking that they're going to have to do to uh, navigate uh, this, this really interesting, dynamic, challenging, and sometimes alienating world of ideas and information. So what I'd like to do right now is show you just a, a clip because I, I do want to spend just a few minutes uh, looking at um, the whole area of the neurosciences because this and i'm just going to take a moment on this but it's very important for us to draw from what we know about uh the cognitive neurosciences in the use of visual tools because we know as teachers they're networks of ideas we know now much more about the brain and how uh processes in the brain work but let's just jump into a first grade classroom here in the Los Angeles area of California to uh, the, the teacher basically was asking students and had taught them about the whole idea of schema and how we have schemas in our brain, networks of ideas. Listen up to these delightful children. You have the schema in your head, and, you, and how come you can make predictions if you already know it? I know, that's why I put my thumbs down. Because what means you use that your when, brain when you to draw the schema. Yeah, you you it helps you um know what the word means. And then in your life, when you remember from a long time, you have schema with the word. Schema is like um. Uh, something that we know that happens to you. Schema is clues. I want you to know that in the schema, the context. Mm -hmm. Everything you know, a center was a schema building. The center? Uh -huh. And we had the text-to-self text -to connection. Uh-huh. And you could map the memories in your life. Okay. Circle map. That's the knowledge and when you say text to text, what does that mean? It, it means it means when a book it reminds you of another book. Ah. Or a film, or a film, or a movie, or a cartoon. Text to self and text to text. The text to self means that it reminds you something about about um you. It reminds you about something that you did of the same of the book that you read. Why do we mean, um, why does um, maths make us, our thoughts, um, neat? Like an introductory lesson as yeah. part of the scaffold. Yeah. So like, we were just getting into the patterns of conflict of stories. Mm -hmm. um, but if you see a map that's in the student's writing, they have obviously a lot more control. Sure. Because they've created the map. And, yeah. Um, so. Obviously a delighted teacher there. Um, her students here are six, seven-year-olds talking about how um, a text relates to their life or a text, a book relates to another book that they've read or the memories in their lives. So I, this, was, uh, this video was delightful because uh, I had been in this school working for uh, a couple of days just interviewing teachers, interviewing students, interviewing uh, head teacher and administrators, admins and leaders in the Long Beach uh, school system. And they saw tremendous jumps in the performance of students. Those with, uh, are learning a second language uh, rather than English. They were using, uh, moving uh, into Spanish and English in dual language program. So what, what I drew away from this is these, these young children were understanding that what was going on in their brain, what they were learning was connecting up and they were always connecting and building uh, a schema of uh, content. And really what we know about the brain is that it is a pattern detector. It's a pattern builder. We build up schema, we build up 
these neural connections that all go together. And what's exciting about this is that the students, when they have a language um, or tools for specifically visually representing their ideas, they have a way of showing what's going on in their brain, not just for the teachers, but for themselves. So they become self-reflective on their own processes and also become self-evaluative. They can become self-assessing. And really that's what we're looking for in education, I believe in the long term, is does a student exiting uh, the high school, the secondary level, have the capacity to think about how they're thinking. And, and that means on a very basic level, that doesn't need to be some, um, some cloud and some mystery. It's just, how am I thinking about these ideas? Can I think about it differently? Am I open to other points of view and perspectives? Can I remain open and add to my schema? So what we do know, just as background, is 90% of all information that comes to our brain is visual. And this is really key. Now, it's, uh, that's true. We have kinesthetic learners. We're all kinesthetic to a certain degree. We're always bringing information uh, auditorily. Um, it, it, we have a rich array of senses that is bringing information. But the dominant the dominant mode of information uh, processing is visual. Our brain is actually has evolved to this place with 40% of nerve fibers connected to the um, brain or linked to the retina and the capacity to remember visual information is really key. So one of the things that visual tools draw on is the, the, the evolutionary development toward visual uh, acuity and visual memory. Uh, I also think I, I, in some ways we should call them visual, spatial, verbal maps that we have going here because what it does is just like any map, whether it's Google map, any kind of road map, any kind of map that we see, we have a spatial array of information and it's visual and oftentimes there's verbal and, and numerical information included in those maps. So this is really how the brain works, is that the brain is always unconsciously connecting all this uh, information. And it's a matter of the students taking control of how they're plugging things together, how they're networking information and giving them the tools that enable them to create their own visual representations and to link a lot of content and thereby to actually remember that content. One of the, uh, I believe one of the, the misunderstood uh, areas of the development of thinking is memory. We often say, oh, rote memorization isn't, isn't uh, the way we want to go. And in fact, I, I agree with that. Though, what we have found and what teachers report, students uh, recognize right quick, is that when they're visually mapping out information, by and large, they are remembering more of that content. So even if we use visual tools for remembering, not even conceptualizing, which is what we really want students to be able to do with the complex knowledge that we're bringing before them, is to be able to understand that they can visually represent information and bring that up as a visual for memory. And it's very much like uh, what we have here with the, with the, the London, the, the tube system. Um, it is around connecting learning. It is, the, the more we learn, the more extensive the connections become, the neural connections. And so we're reinforcing that networking capacity that the brain has. And that uh, we see those operating together. Uh, this is a visual that you know very well. And, um, it's, it's one that represents, in fact, how much information can be compressed into one page. So what we're looking at is that rich array. And what we want to do right now is, is take a moment and jump into a, uh, a video that was produced by the Academy Trust where uh, teachers had been introduced to the idea of visual tools and in this workshop by Hannah Miller, which we're gonna show, uh, they discuss the different types of visual tools they've used 
and um, actually the effectiveness of those tools. So enjoy this few minutes of video and I'll be right back. I'm not specifically thinking maps, but they're maps, aren't they? You're mapping it over. Okay. Right, so I'm going to pause you there. I'm um, just going to ask for a couple of ideas uh, from some of the groups. So, can we start off with this back group here? Um, why do you personally, in your own practice, use visual tools? We've got quite a few ideas here. Yep. Organising thoughts. Cool. Uh, so whether it's our own or the other, or somebody we're, we're sharing the idea with, getting them to organise and share their ideas, or organise actually organise our own thoughts on a different scale. Yeah, definitely. So when you think about obviously, especially novice learners, we think about the youngest of our learners. What we're trying to do is almost introduce them to our our domain. Our you know, I always think about it as like a sphere of knowledge. Now, if I'm the expert in that field. I've got all these different nodes and they're all interconnected and everything clearly makes sense. But when I'm trying to explain something to them, something that I might just clearly take for granted, you know, they quite often will need a structure or a framework to organise that to support it. Cool. Um, so when you think about that, that structure in an organisation, are there any particular tools that you use? Well, I would say that this is similar to when I've done story building, story maps, that yeah. type of mapping out on... Um, a sort of known framework, how to plan something, yeah, and sort definitely. of record yeah. thoughts in a particular way. Yeah, excellent. Cool. So something that goes almost step by step. Yeah. This happens and this happens and yeah. this happens. Lovely. Uh, did you have any different ideas? We said for variety. <coughs> variety is one that well in lesson. Um, we said to engage different learners, so you can use them for differentiation as well in teaching. Um, assess prior knowledge. We can use for different you know, ways to engage people. And yeah, definitely, and I'll probably say that's one of the biggest benefits at primary and at secondary is that general idea that a lot of our students, without some kind of framework, when you say to them, you know, tell me what you're thinking, or can you jot down your ideas on a piece of paper, if you just give them a blank piece of paper, you know, nine times out of ten they sit there for about five minutes and they're like, I, I know what I'm thinking, and they sometimes they can talk through it, but actually getting it down on paper and then being able to build something from that can sometimes be a bit more difficult. So yeah, it definitely provides them a structure for that. Uh, anything else from this table? Um, we've got quite a lot of the same things, but we were talking about um, using what you said earlier, going up to writing through a process. Um, we were also kind of like what you were just saying, thinking about um, getting to the point where they can kind of say, right, I've got a thought in my head, how do I represent it? And then choosing which, um, like, kind of thinking map they need for that. I don't think my class is at that point yet, but I'm yes. we're talking about the ultimate goal, like, yeah. them being able to use I know some 16 year olds aren't at that point, so it's fine, yeah. <laughs> being yeah. able to, like, structure their own thinking. Yeah, definitely, and I think that's the whole point. If we can provide them with a framework, if we can provide them with a language for their learning, as they do move up through education, when it comes to, you know, key stage four and they're revising and they're doing things like that, actually, they've got these methods at hand. Um, and some of it links to some of the, you know, more, the more recent cognitive science. When you think about cognitive load, especially in primary schools, you know, sometimes I walk in and I'm like, wow, like these walls, this mad, there's loads and loads of stuff going on. And then you think about these learners, and you know, they've got lots of different focuses and actually what we want to do is reduce that extraneous load. We want them to focus on the learning that's at hand. And again, these maps can support that. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation uh, facilitated by Hannah Miller um, with her colleagues uh, at a school in the Academy Trust, really looking at uh, the different kinds of visual tools they've used, um, such as for storyboarding and, and such over the years and the effectiveness of those tools. And we're gonna jump back in in our next sessions with a much more extensive video as Hannah introduces her colleagues to uh, the thinking maps and really interviews students and, and uh, head teachers as well. And what I'd like to do is really now jump into these different types, provide an overview of different types of visual tools and um, also recognize that a range of learners can use these tools. Even if uh, a student is not dominantly a visual learner, if they're auditory and, and strongly auditory or really need to always be manipulating things and kinesthetic, 
uh, what we want to do is round out the range of and balance of different kinds of representations. And uh, w one of the things, one of the experiences I had very early on when I was uh, starting to conduct uh, training and, and doing professional development with, with teachers. So I went to a school and I was introducing the idea of the thinking maps. And one of the teachers put up her hand and said, just a minute, how do these visual tools work um, for all students? My students are blind. And I was really struck by that, that, um, that here I am representing these visual tools that can be used by all students. And um, she's saying, my blind students, how are they gonna use visual tools? She came back, the next time I came back to the school, she came back and offered me this. Her students had used a braille machine to create braille thinking maps. And here's an example of a circle map, which we're gonna get into later. But it was um, a recognition by me that, and, and her, is that the um, visual tools are really about patterns. Whether they're touched by a student using a braille machine, or a lot of students that are hard of hearing uh, or in deaf schools here in the United States in particular, have been using the thinking maps because they really reach to a deeper level than what's visual. It's visual, spatial, it's tactile even, in the sense of representing and touching information. Here's an example by um, uh, a student who was assigned the task of writing an essay about uh, the beach or experience that he had had recently. And um, what, what the uh, student did was create a braille thinking map of the beach with all the information surrounding it being very generative and creative. And this led to the piece of writing by David Rivera about uh, the beach. And he was again using the braille machine. So what this told me, what I got very interested in is how all learners have access to patterns of thinking. And that's really key to a definition of visual tools generally. So let's look at different types of visual tools. And again, I'm gonna be drawing on the, the book, Visual Tools for Transforming Information into Knowledge. But in that book, I lay out what I consider to be from the research, from my experiences as well, three fundamental types of visual tools. And you may recognize these uh, to a certain degree. You may have used all of them to a certain degree. Uh, but they're really what I understand to be three types. One is uh, the brainstorming webs that have been around for many, many years. Actually, uh, Tony Buzon uh, generated the whole mind mapping approach over 50 years ago. Um, and different techniques and different technologies have now been used to develop this form. A second is what I call task specific or what most people call just graphic organizers. But task specific graphic organizers are those developed oftentimes by teachers or they're in textbooks and they're relatively static graphics either represented to students or students fill them in. There are things like what we have used, such as uh, storyboards and timelines and, and problem solution graphics and, and cause and effect fishbone diagrams. They're sort of these isolated, very, very useful for specific task organizers. And then a third type is called what I call thinking process maps. And um, one specific type that I got very interested in when I was teaching early on, very early on, was concept mapping. And this was developed by Novak and Gowan uh, out of Cornell University here in the United States. And it's used quite extensively, mo mostly in the secondary area. And it was uh, an integrated uh, look at a hierarchy of information. And, and in a few minutes, I'll be able to to give you uh, a closer look at one of those. And systems diagramming and systems thinking, and then within this category as well, I put uh, thinking maps, which we're gonna go into in, in quite a bit of detail in the next two or three sessions. So let me jump to the whiteboard for a second and, and give some uh, visual explanation of these uh, three types. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, uh, because we really wanna get into more uh, complex uses, but 
take a moment here and, and we'll jump over to the whiteboard and, and look at these three different types and make some comparisons. And then we'll, we'll move on. So I just wanted to give a brief overview of these three different types of visual tools. Uh, brainstorming webs, task-specific graphic organizers, and thinking process maps. So Tony Buzan's work with mind mapping really was a breakthrough in the use of visual tools. And it's very simple. He, let's say he was taking a topic like an apple for students to think about. Basically, it just comes from the center and the ideas get webbed out. And let's say the apple was assigned as the, the content that was being taught for early years students. The teacher might say, well, I'd like you to think about the different types of apples. Maybe they're golden delicious, um, that they're uh, Granny Smith apples. They're all different types, depends on where you live. Might also put information into the map about how they're grown. Could also put information about where they're grown. And notice it's just a continuous webbing out and a mind mapping of whatever the student is thinking about a certain topic. Notice mind maps basically start in the center and they branch out with groups of ideas. So very creative, highly generative, and a way for teachers to uh, engender in students the capacity to just open up their, their thinking and show what they know. Another type of graphic uh, is the task-specific graphic organizer. Oftentimes these are preset, there's a sequence or an idea that uh, teachers want to have students uh, focus on. So there might be a preset map such as a simple flow chart with instructions for what to do. Again, let's take the example of an apple. A teacher may want the students to identify how the, the apple is grown how it's produced over time, how it's taken to market, and the uses at home. So this may be preset, and the teacher uh, just offers it to the student as a structure for the thinking. It can't, most of the time, uh, task-specific organizers are analytic. They just really are step-by-step -step or procedural they don't really engender the kind of open-ended thinking that mind mapping does. Now a third type of visual tool is what we call the thinking process maps and this includes concept mapping. Now Novak and Gowan when they created concept mapping were really interested in the hierarchy of knowledge. So the students learn basically to, to take a topic such as apples and create a conceptual diagram of all the information that they know in a very systematic way about apples, such as types, uses, and uh, other information such as how they're uh, produced over time. And what happens is, is that as students are using these, they are also making linkages between different bits of information. So it, it's interesting that these maps actually, with the same content information, have different structures. And what's important is, is that the students learn how to use them in an independent way or collaboratively over time. But again, Brainstorming webs for creativity, task-specific organizers for analytic work, and concept mapping for conceptual thinking processes and showing an integration of ideas. Each one of these types of visual tools is powerful in and of itself, and it's really about student fluency and their development of uh, the use of the tool over time. So let's jump back into some other types of visual tools and examples. Well, um, what, what I just did on the whiteboard, uh, playing out those, the different types of visual tools, um, it's just a starting point to go, 
go a little bit deeper. But I do want to uh, just offer a few of um, a few ideas here about these different types of, of visual tools. I, I used to use mind mapping all the time, and I still, to a certain degree, use it for for some things. But one of the problems, one of the difficulties and challenges with uh, brainstorming webs or mind maps is after the brainstorm, what happens after the storm? And I love this cartoon, it sort of uh, represents um, one, of the, one of the challenges really of brainstorming after using, after using them, uh, mind mapping and different even uh, software apps for mind mapping is how do you then take all this um, disparate information that has sort of all of these connections, sort of connecting the dots, but doesn't really show the patterns of the deeper patterns of thinking that are going on there. So when I used mind mapping early on, one of the difficulties that students had was going from the mind map to, let's say, a piece of writing. And here this professor is saying, well, it's all plotted out. I've got it all. Uh, it's all there, right? But now I just have to write it. So that's one of the concerns and difficulties of using mind mapping is that there is a, not a, 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 a sussing out of those different patterns that students could, could see and then organize on their way to a piece of writing or any kind of presentation or deeper understanding. So uh, that's one of the difficulties. Still very worthwhile um, mind mapping is uh, ac across uh, age levels. And it's a good starting point actually for visual tools. The graphic organizers, the task specific organizers, the difficulty there um, for, for many of us is that it's an overwhelming number of different types of graphic organizers. So with mind mapping, you sort of start in the center and branch out and it's one format by and large. When you go to graphic organizers, you have an endless number of different kinds of graphics. Uh, it's as a matter of fact, students get overwhelmed as teachers often do. I certainly did with all these different kinds of graphics. It's, it's um, you know, flow charting and tree diagrams and concept mapping and Venn diagrams and, and fishbone diagrams and uh, this down at the bottom, this uh, sequencing snake. So there are all these different types of visual tools what I call graphic organizers. And what this does is it helps students on specific tasks, but it doesn't really ensure that they're gonna internalize the kind of thinking that's required to create these maps on their own. So they're oftentimes teacher-centered or textbook-centered or on the web-centered rather than developed by the students in collaborative settings or individually. So if you do a, um, a search of graphic organizers on the web, which you'll do, and you'll find out that there are quite a few, like millions of them all over the place. Um, there even, if you go to Microsoft Word, there's SmartArt, um, LucidChart, uh, Inspiration Software, endless possibilities. Yet what we're really looking at is how to consolidate this all these different graphics to make them um, usable uh, in a way that students can use them together interactively when they're not presented with a graphic, they can do it on their own and not being overwhelmed. So that's really key. So let me just take a look at what uh, I talked about earlier with concept mapping though, one of the, the th this third type of, of visual tool that I call thinking process maps. And concept mapping, here's an example we're gonna look at um, with the field of algebra, uh, is, is basically a hierarchical design and students, learners at every age, again, learn how to develop concept maps so they can use them on their own at any time and develop them on a blank page or blank screen and they can use them collaboratively. They can share, share the maps. One of the difficulties with mind mapping and one of the difficulties with graphic organizers is that they, they're not really a language that is easily shareable and that teachers can uh, evaluate and assess and students can become more self-assessing as well with. 
So here's an example of concept mapping. And I'm gonna show you slide at a time, but a student, and this was at the secondary level, uh, was given the assignment of over the, the semester, over the course in algebra to map out, using concept mapping, map out algebra. This is pretty impressive. So he starts off by saying algebra is generalized arithmetic and involves and uses and it, he keeps expanding. This is over like a five month to eight month period of time, a total vision of what he considered to be algebra. Now this isn't doing algebra, but it shows that this student has internalized all the different areas of algebra and connects them together. What I like about this and what's really impressive is that this took several years really of developing the capacity to do concept mapping. And that's really what this is about. It's being able to go from a novice level with very simple concept maps on a blank page and slowly but surely growing a concept. So that's the kind of thing that is key and it really leads to the kinds of uh, different types of questions that we ask uh, when we're trying to conceptualize. Are they inference questions or interpretation questions? Do they help transfer? Are they questions about hypotheses? Are they reflective questions? So one of the things that we're, we're using either brainstorming webs and um, graphic organizers or concept maps or even thinking maps, which we'll take a look at, what are the kinds of questions and what's the content that is driving the development of these different types of visual tools? Uh, to me, this is really key that the questions come from the kind of cognitive processes we have and the kind of thinking that we're doing and that we're requiring of students. So these three types of visual tools are really key. Let's now jump back into a conversation with Hannah Miller and her colleagues about the effectiveness of these different types of visual tools. So today you used a circle map as part of a main activity and there was lots of discussion around that and students working together. And you also used a flow map to identify the stages of success criteria. Are there any other ways that you use the maps? So almost as starter activities or, may, or maybe to consolidate learning or other, apart from success criteria and main activity? Yeah, um, we've recently just spent quite a long period of time on sentence structure. And one of our assessment methods of that was we gave the children um, like different examples of simple sentences, compound sentences, complex sentences, short phrases, um, expanded noun phrases and things like that. And we gave them a blank tree map um, with those headings on so, and they had to sort the, you know, the, the actual statements and the actual uh, pieces of text under the right heading. So we do use them, as I say, for tasks, but also for um, little assessment activities like that to be able to see, you know, at the end of a topic, have, have the children understood. Okay, so why do you use the maps as part of your teaching? I use the maps to, uh, as a visual organiser for the children, so in any lesson that we use the maps in, they can use the same skill across the curriculum. Um, I also use the maps um, to stretch and develop. It's good for differentiation and it's easy because the children um, recognise the maps, they understand the skill and then they can apply it because they, they focus on the learning rather than just um, what the map is showing them. So Sam, you teach a slightly younger mm -hmm. set of children. Um, why do you find the maps beneficial? Um, with a younger group of children, it's quite hard for them to organise sort of thoughts and processes that they're going through. And with the maps, it enables them to put it into small steps. And with younger children, it's easier in smaller sets rather than a big chunk. I want you to be able to do all this, break it down. And we use a lot of a flow map for success criteria because that's really nice to break it down into this is what you've got to do first and enable you to do this. And then even look at it even closely and think about the thought process that's going into it. Well, why do I need to find this out? What other knowledge can I bring into it to use it? Very similar to what Sam said, we do lose a lot of scaffolding as our differentiation. So if we had a bubble map and we're describing a character, we would put the nouns in the bubbles and get them to describe the adjectives. But with the more able children, we'd pretty much take everything away and just have a visual picture in the middle and say, what can you see and get them to describe it that way? Well, I really enjoyed those uh, 
those comments by the teachers there uh, that Hannah Miller was working with uh, to really look at exactly the influences of, of different kinds of visual tools and specifically thinking maps uh, with their students. Uh, I, I think that one of, the, one of the important and key messages to pull away from what they were having to say is that they can use them as they need uh, or as students can use them if they develop fluency with the visual tools, they can use them as they need in the classroom, in the moment, but also consistently over time. So they become much like um, you know, speaking and writing. They become the water uh, that we swim in on a day-to-day -day basis in classrooms. Um, with our few minutes left here, I wanna just jump in and introduce the thinking maps and we're gonna be spending quite a bit of time on them and Hannah Miller is gonna be able to uh, spend uh, some time introducing each one of the, the thinking maps in the future uh, seminar. But here's, the, here's the, this type of uh, thinking process uh, maps and here is a model that I developed and it's based on those kinds of important questions that we ask on a day-to-day -day basis and it becomes a common visual language for learners across not just a classroom but whole schools and uh, whole learning communities. So the eight thinking maps really reflect fundamental cognitive processes and that's why we call them thinking process maps. Um, we ask questions every day, such as using the circle map, what's the context for how you're defining this idea? So we use the circle map. What are the descriptions? What are the qualities of, of that character? Could you compare that character with another character? What are the main ideas using the tree map and supporting ideas? What are the, what are the parts of this whole object or what's the setting of the story? What's the sequence or plot analysis of the story that's going on using the flow map? Predict what's gonna happen next in the story using the cause and effect multi-flow map, or really looking at what caused a character to um, take a certain action and what are the ripple effects. And the use of the bridge map for analogies, for really looking at uh, conceptual analogies and metaphors and similes that are embedded in the way we think and the way story is developed. So the eight thinking maps reflect fundamental cognitive processes and they provide a visual means for students to be able to really bring forward and create their ideas, to organize their ideas, to conceptualize and to see how different patterns work together. So each of the thinking maps based on a, a thought process the circle map for defining in context, the brace map for spatial part whole reasoning, the multi flow map for cause and effect reasoning, the bubble map for describing, the tree map for classifying information or grouping ideas from main idea to supporting ideas, the flow map for sequencing, the bridge map for seeing relationships and making analogies, and the double bubble map for comparing and contrasting. Now notice how I just presented those to you. There's no order to these. There's no higher order to one thought process over another. They're really a constellation of thinking processes that, found, uh, that are found in how the brain actually functions and how we, our mind actually works. We do this every day, every discipline. Interdisciplinary, as well as transdisciplinary and problems that such as climate change that go across different disciplines very richly. So this also in the, uh, the thinking maps model, we include the frame of reference and this can go around any one of the eight thinking maps. And this really becomes what we call a metacognitive frame. It's stepping back out of the frame that we have and saying what is influencing how we are organizing and creating our, our ideas and patterning information. We're gonna go much more into the frame in the future um, seminars that we have uh, you know, with each other. And we're gonna go deeply into how this really supports students in becoming reflective as they get into virtual re, um, reality of 
of the webinars such as what we're doing is how to really focus on the information that's there, but also how to reframe that information and to think and reflect on what the presenter is doing or what this video shows or what this movie clip says or what this politician says. So this is key, this frame of reference. So it isn't just about creating or brainstorming ideas. It isn't just about can we organize those ideas. It isn't necessarily even how we just pattern the ideas using fundamental thinking processes. It's that metacognitive frame to be able to step back and gain perspective on our ideas and what other people are presenting to us. So one of the uh, resources that you have is the, the book that uh, came with this course, which is Developing Connective Leadership, which will give you many more uh, ideas and background information on the use of thinking maps in communities such as uh, a, a classroom, a whole school, or across a whole system. So you may want to look at the first chapter of this book to provide even uh, more background on the thinking maps as we proceed uh, in, in this course. And just to let you know, Next time up, this was just a short introduction of looking at visual tools and actually reframing the use beyond just uh, brainstorming webs or graphic organizers or even concept maps to reframe this around how we're using visual tools and for what purpose. Next time up, we're gonna get together and go really into detail on thinking process maps, specifically concept mapping, and then into thinking maps. So I hope uh, you enjoyed this hour. It was introductory in nature, but I also wanted to uh, provide a frame for the, the rest of our time together. So be well, see you next time.